e whakamoi me tia tuana a hau ki ngā honore mema e noho nei. Kia ora koutou katoa. Ko te take i mōtini atu ai a hau ki te tūmua ki honore me ngā mema honore ka mahia he ture e tēnei whare ki a whakamana ngā wahine ki te poti me mamo rātou ki te paremata Māori. I salute the honourable members of this gathering. Greetings. I move this motion before the principal member and all honourable members so that a law may emerge from this parliament, allowing women to vote and women to be accepted as members of the parliament. The following are my reasons for presenting this motion. He nui ngā wahine o nui tīreni ko a mate a rātou tāne. A he whenua karati, papatupu o rātou. There are many women who have been widowed and own much land. He nui ngā wahine o nui tīreni ko a mate o rātou matua. Kaore o rātou tu ngāngē. He karati, he papatupu o rātou. There are many women whose fathers have died and do not have brothers. He nui ngā wahine mōhio o nui tīreni kei te moi tāne. Kaore ngā tāne e mōhio ki te whakahaere i o rāua whenua. There are many women who are knowledgeable of the management of land where their husbands are not. He nui ngā wahine kua korohiketia o rātou matua. He wahine mōhio he karati he papatupu o rātou. There are many women whose fathers are elderly, who are also knowledgeable of the management of land and own land. He nui ngā tāne rangatira o te motu nei, koa i noi ki te kwini. Mō ngā mate e pā ara ki a tātou, a kaore tonu tātou i pā ki te ora i runga i tā rātou i noi tanga. There have been many male leaders who have petitioned the Queen concerning the many issues that affect us all. However, we have not yet been adequately compensated according to those petitions. Nā reira, ka anoi a hau ki tēnei whare ki a tū te mema wahine. Ma tēnei pia e tika ai, a tērā ka tika ki te tuku i noi ngā mema wahine ki te kwini. Mō ngā mate kua pā nei ki a tātou me o tātou whenua. A te rapea e whakaai mai a te kwini ki te i noi o ona hoa wahine Māori. I te mea he wahine ano hoki a te kwini. Therefore, I pray to this gathering that women members be appointed. Perhaps by this course of action, we may be satisfied concerning the many issues affecting us and our land. Perhaps the Queen may listen to the petitions if they are presented by her Māori sisters, since she is a woman as well.
have spent my life um, working to protect those who have the least power from its abuse. And one of those groups of people is cannabis smokers in the sense that they are often young, they are often um, without economic power, they're often from some other um, discriminated group, whether it's Māori or Pacific Island. Um, they're, they're often people that have just had the least opportunity to have a say about what happens to them. And this law is used to abuse them. What is the harm you're trying to prevent? Well, some drugs can cause harm, and cannabis can cause harm for some people. So what is the harm, and what is the public policy approach you should take to that harm? The prohibition, um, leading as it does to convictions and to jail time, creates an extraordinary amount of harm. Our, our system is not working, definitely not working. Banning drugs, I know, will not work. I've seen too much devastation, and I've seen so many families going through hell. And I believe that the only way that we can fix the problem we've got is to decriminalise. We've got to take it out of the gangs. Everyone's saying to me, you've got to ban this, ban that, ban that. Jesus, I, prohibition's never worked. Because it was growing so much up north, the boys did become very protective over their plots. Razor blades, guns, wrong identity, people being killed. I went to go and get some, and there was guys at the gate with their guns. If Marijuana was legal. People like me, we could become a registered home grower. And the resources that the police are putting into stopping marijuana growers could go into better things, like trying to stop the war on pee, which is the most, for me, is the worst drug on this earth. I started helping families that have been affected with the methamphetamine families whose children have committed suicide. I was going in and helping them, cutting their children down that have hung themselves. I have a niece and a nephew, and thank goodness they've come on the other side. It, it, it was very devastating. Um, P has... Um, no, it doesn't discriminate against breaking down the brain cells, their consciences, their um, self-worth, and it ends up in violence. It ends up in um, people being really hurt. Yeah, and that's what happened with my niece and my nephew. One of the saddest times in our family. At the very beginning when I started uh, the P-March, I was against marijuana, I was against all drugs, but there's a place for marijuana, I can see that, and I believe marijuana should be a medical substance. I'm using marijuana to help pee addicts for, with their cravings, so, and it's working, so we've got to look outside the square. If you do apply a rational scientific approach to cannabis laws, you can only come up with the view that prohibition doesn't work and should be done away with. The impacts, particularly say for a, um, the working man in the family, in the Māori family for example, in particular, or any family really, you're taking the person out of their job so the income of that family is, is gone. That then requires that family to rely on the state. There's a, a whole lot of costs involved in keeping in contact with your family member who's in jail. If you're a Māori man, that turned out to be the most significant factor for being stopped and searched by the cops. You're also more likely to be convicted of that use and you're also more likely to go to jail. You're four times more likely to get diversion if you're white. Because the police are pretty pretty tough. They, um, it's almost like a discrimination. Does it make you feel angry that you're, you're criminalised? I mean, yes, absolutely. Yep, definitely. Because... Um, I have a daughter that's quite religious and when she had her children, her first child, it was like, oh, I'm the one that's going to be a bad influence on my grandchild because I smoke herb. That's the way the law is, it tells people that I'm a criminal and I'm not. Yep, I'm not. You don't need a hog up on one line, all these lanes are open, they are all going to be searched. Just don't get snapped, okay? We're in for a good day. Have your bag ready to be searched, bro. Come on, don't waste. Don't waste. Hey, Elvis.
better spell that now. If you ain't getting up through the gate, open. Gonna discriminate Move along, bro, or okay. get out. Take your pick. Take any contraband off yourself that shouldn't be on you. Because once they got your snap, girlfriend, you are so gonna lose it. Empty that. On Papa to Anuku, not in the bin. Are you talking about the herb is confiscated and people come here because it's a reggae concert? Yeah, it sucks. I know it sucks, but that's the, that's the rule. But there ain't much herb confiscated, it's mostly alcohol. You know, future concerts need to be more lenient and understanding of the cope up. I say stick to the weed people and you'll be happy, happy. Go through, honey. Have we got tickets? Have you got tickets? Just go on through. Never. I'm warning you, girl. I'm giving you time to get it out of your bag before you get there. Eric, spark it up now. Save yourself 120 bucks loss. Take the goods off yourself. I don't believe we should sit back and um, follow other countries, particularly, particularly America. And I think this is this is the problem with New Zealand. We tend to sit back and wait to see what happens around the world before we actually turn around and do anything and in, in between time we've lost so many of our young people. Well for young people of course it's very difficult if they have a conviction it can be very difficult for them to travel and so you are cutting off a huge range of future prospects for that young person. We need them to be to, have, to be able to exercise um, the greatest freedom to realise their potential and yet you know they're the most likely to be targeted by the police under prohibition laws they're the most likely to get the harsher sentences, most likely to lose those opportunities, which, which impoverishes us all. Putting somebody in jail for something as stupid as cannabis possession is likely to lead them to re-offend, and possibly re-offend worse because of all of the frustration and anger and rage at having been so unjustly treated. The lack of community awareness around the impacts of prohibition law on um, on cannabis users, on the sense of prejudice about cannabis users and the emotion that is propagated by politicians when talking about the issue. It's very difficult to have a conversation about cannabis these days that doesn't also involve reference to methamphetamine. The cannabis issue is um, transformed into an issue about some other kind of drug that causes some other kind of harm um, as a way of avoiding the issues around cannabis, which is that it is much less harmful than both tobacco and alcohol, is very, very widely used. The law itself doesn't prevent people from using cannabis, but it does prevent people getting help if they do feel they've got a problem. And so it clearly is not working. What do you think would be the effect on the pea trade and alcohol abuse? Do oh, it will go down. It's got to. Decriminalising any drug will help with the other problems that we suffer in the communities here. It's worked overseas, it will work here, trust me. Keep the flow moving! Gentle! Gentle! Caress it! That's the way! We're riding the wave of love! We are good sisters, we are good sisters. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It's almost 25 years, a quarter of a century, since methamphetamine use exploded in New Zealand. But despite the well-documented dangers of meth use and high-profile busts, tens of thousands of Kiwi adults are estimated to use methamphetamine every year. The history of the drug in New Zealand and the government's policy responses have been meticulously documented in Mad on Meth. The author is familiar to many of our viewers, Benedict Collins. Kia ora, good morning. Good morning, Jack. Um, let's go back 25 yeah. years. Between 1998 and 2001, pea use in New Zealand increased almost a thousand percent. What was it about that period that led to such an influx? Yeah, so, so it did increase radically, right? But it came off a very, very low base. Very few people were using methamphetamine. And then in the late 90s, things did really start to take off. You know, people started basically figuring out that they could take pseudoephedrine, cold and flu medicine. You know, add some other ingredients and cook methamphetamine and it just absolutely exploded. But I think, yeah, like we said in the intro there, I think a lot of people don't quite realise that it was, you know, in the 50s and 60s, methamphetamine, you, you could go to the doctor, you could get a prescription for it. It was mainly um, middle-aged women who were getting prescriptions for methamphetamine, but amphetamines also were really widely available. Um, and for a long time, you didn't even need a prescription, right? 
sports teams were using them. There's this um, really interesting letter of a complaint from the Waikato Cycling Association who wrote to the national body saying, we're really worried that all the cyclists, the um, recent national champs were like taking, they called them pet pills, yeah. um, methane amphetamine pills, you know, incredibly widely used in New Zealand and they just weren't a problem. One of the favourite things I got in the book was actually I looked back through the Hansards and in the 1960s, a National Party MP stood up in Parliament because um, some people were raising concerns about how widely available amphetamines and meth were. And he was like, no, no, amphetamines are a great boon to society when they're used correctly. So it, they weren't that controversial. It's a national MP. Yeah, yeah, right? Like, yeah, yeah kind of delicious looking at, um, looking at things, you know, where national stands now on drugs. But yeah, they, they weren't very controversial. They yeah. were widely used. You know, often media stories would just talk about, you know, a pianist trying to break a record, um, you know, it was popping amphetamine pills as he did it, it wasn't controversial. But yeah, 1975, things really changed there um, with the Misuse of Drugs Act coming in. Mm. And then it was, yeah, pretty quiet. We didn't, there were a few sort of articles in, in the press over the next couple of decades. But then, yeah, in the late 1990s, things really took off. People started cooking. And you can just look even at the meth lab bus, like there's one or two a year in the 90s. And by the early 2000s, you're starting to get one yeah. or 200 a year. It really took off. Why does pee have such a stigma compared to some other drugs? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? I think, one, it, it is highly addictive, OK? So they, they think, basically, if you get to the point where you're using methamphetamine regularly, you end up with about a 15% chance of becoming addicted to methamphetamine. And that's horrific, right? When I've talked to lots of people in the, throughout the book who, who have you know, been heavy, heavy users themselves yeah. or, have, you know, come out the other side or, or are still using, um, you know, and their lives get turned upside down. One of the things I thought was quite interesting talking to a lot of people who had used meth is they say it's only once they've kind of come out the other side and realised and, and, and got clean and looked back and been like, wow, my world was upside down. Mm. They didn't really appreciate that at the time because the drive's just so strong to keep getting methamphetamine. I think, yeah, in, in terms of the stigma, I think, you know, the way the, the media talks about methamphetamine all the time um, really contributes to that. Mm. You know, and I sort of talk about that in the book. We do, we've done it with every other drug in the past as well, but, you know, once a government outlaws a drug, it's regularly referred to as, you know, as a demon, as it's evil, it's a scourge. And that does kind of put stigma mm. on the people who use that drug, right? And it really becomes quite a stigmatised substance. I want to consider some of the policy responses yep. over the years. How do you reflect on the pea house saga? Yeah, I mean, that was really interesting, right? So but the government was really struggling. You had these really high profile, horrific crimes that were tied to methamphetamine. Think, you know, Anthony Dixon with the, the samurai sword for one. So the government kind of... Uh, was struggling and, and lots more people were starting to use it, especially in the early 2000s. So they came in and they banned pseudoephedrine. And at around that time, the Ministry of Health got together and they said, hey, look, so, there's so many meth labs in houses now. We need to come up with some rules mm. to make sure that they're safe to go back into. And so they looked around the world. And that's, and that's because when people are cooking meth, they're using other chemicals as well. Overseas, there are examples of people like using lead, highly toxic chemicals when mm. they're manufacturing methamphetamine. The concern that those, those chemicals will contaminate houses. That's right. And so methamphetamine was always like the marker chemical. They yeah. weren't so worried about the, in the original guidelines, about the meth itself. But it was the detection that was the marker chemical. If you could get meth down to a very tiny number, and we're talking like, half a millionth of a gram, then the house was safe. But what the um, Housing New Zealand and the government kind of did was say, hey, look, we're going to go into houses, we're going to test, and if we find any methamphetamine at all, then you're in a world of trouble. People were getting, like, evicted from their homes mm. for a few millionths of a gram of methamphetamine. And the problem with that is, as Fair Go pointed out many years ago, was that, you know, you pick up a banknote in New Zealand, it's got methamphetamine on it, meth sticks to surfaces. So people were getting... You know, evicted from their homes for mm. a few millionths of a gram of methamphetamine. Often, especially with Housing New Zealand tenants, who where tenancies change quite a lot, you know, there was no proof that these people had ever e even used the substance themselves. Yeah. You know, it was a government out of control. Yeah, it, it's really interesting to consider some of the other policy responses. You mentioned the um, pseudoephedrine ban yep. in yep. New Zealand. So since that ban came into place, the size of methamphetamine busts in New Zealand has grown and grown and grown. And the price of methamphetamine in New Zealand has dropped and dropped and dropped, indicating that actually the supply has increased in New Zealand. So has that been effective? Well, well, there's, there's two parts to this, right? It was kind of highly ineffective in a way because it made it a lot harder for your, your small-time methamphetamine cooks to get their hands on the precursor that they needed to make methamphetamine. 
And countries all around the world were doing this at the same time. They were restricting access, the public's access, to pseudoephedrine. Mm. Okay, but what happened then was um, cartels in Mexico, um, warlords up in Myanmar figured out, ooh, there's a big gap in the market, right? And so methamphetamine production, they, they have these super labs in these countries, in, in Mexico, in Myanmar. These super labs can churn out tons of methamphetamine. And so what you saw is domestic production really go down. But the international um, methamphetamine trade has gone through the absolute roof, right? I think in the late 1990s, they were, they were getting like a ton of methamphetamine a year. Last year, they got nearly 400 tons, right? The amount of meth coming into New Zealand now is mm. insane. We're, uh, multiple times this year, our record for the biggest bust has been broken. Twice this year, we've had busts of around three quarters of a ton mm. of methamphetamine coming in. So, yeah, it, it really has evolved. Um, yeah, even though I think with good intentions that they came in with this, yeah. you know, the pseudoephedrine ban, it did, it did kind of transform yeah. things. It's, it's interesting to compare the approach to methamphetamine, which is often erred on the punitive side of things, yeah. with the health approach that we've taken with some other drugs, even in small ways like needle exchanges and things like that. What do you think it will take in New Zealand from a policy perspective to get better control over methamphetamine use and reduce it among New Zealand adults? So, yeah, I mean... Tricky question, but one of the, um, Helen Clark and the New Zealand Drug Foundation, they put out a report um, uh, about a year ago, I think, and they sort of argued that maybe it's time to trial a safe supply scheme, right, where, where you'd go out into communities and basically give people amphetamines, alternatives to methamphetamine, or even methamphetamine itself, to try and get them out of the black market, to try and get them away from the gangs. Mm. And overseas, and even with um, uh, methadone and stuff like that, mm. when, when you give people supply to the, these drugs through a government-funded scheme, basically, pretty quickly the use starts coming down. They're not having to commit crimes in order to raise money to get the methamphetamine in the first time. I think it'll be tricky to do that, especially given the geography of methamphetamine. We know it's really concentrated in small, uh, often Māori rural towns in New Zealand. That's where use is the highest. Right. So rolling out a safe supply scheme, I, th I think geographically would, would be tricky in New Zealand, but I think it's worth a shot, right? Because I think Methamphetamine, undoubtedly very, very harmful, but s almost so much more of the harm comes, you know, from, from the gangsters and the gangs that are running the drug, mm. right? The standovers, the beatings, the untold murders, and they're just so in control of the methamphetamine trade now that it's coming in internationally. Um, I, I, I yeah. think I'll give that a go if I was the government, at least explore it. Hey, if it didn't work, well, so be it, but it'd at least be a shot to try and get, you know, people out of these you know, yeah. horrendous situations. Yeah, it is a fascinating mm. subject. Congratulations. I don't know how you find enough hours in the day <laughs> to get, get through it all, but we really appreciate your time. Benedict Collins' Thanks. new book is Mad on Meth, How New Zealand Got Hooked on P. And the book is out at all good bookstores this week. Steve, we speak at an interesting time with um, the long-awaited legalisation experiment uh, rolling out in several places. How, how would you characterise the situation at the moment? Um, I, would, I would say that the, uh, that the prohibitionist consensus globally is now fairly decisively fractured. It's not just that people are talking about the debate. I mean, the debate has been going on since cannabis prohibition began 50, whatever it is, years ago. Um, it's moved not just into the mainstream political and public discourse, but it's actually moved from theory into reality. So we've now got multiple jurisdictions have uh, decriminalised personal possession in different ways and with different civil penalties. But I think most significantly we've got uh, three jurisdictions now are implementing, in the process of implementing, uh, actual legal regulated market models for non-medical use of uh, cannabis. So the two states in the US, Washington and Colorado, um, and uh, at, a, at a nation state level, Uruguay and Latin America. And a bunch of other places are now talking about it. So. We've, we've moved very much into uh, a phase of development and implementation of actual uh, policy, and we're going to have to see how it plays out. Clearly, these are only just beginning, um, and we're going to have to wait and see what, see what the outcomes are. But it, we, we've, we've moved very decisively from a theoretical debate into actual policy development implementation. Uh, but, of course, the two US states aren't doing it in the way that you or Transform would have recommended. Well, the US is a pretty uh, unique uh, political cultural environment. Um, they're obviously quite averse to um, sort of too interventionist an approach from government. They're very much a sort of, they have a fairly ideological commitment to 
uh, sort of free markets and, and freedom of commercial speech and so on. So some of the things about the, the Washington, Colorado models uh, wouldn't be exactly how we would have had it. Um, we, we're, very, we're, we're very clear um, in our thinking that there are real risks um, in over commercialization of um, cannabis markets in, in, in a post-prohibition scenario. And we, we're very keen to look at the mistakes that have been made with Alcon Tobacco, um, identify what those risks are with commercialization, try and mitigate them as we design and develop and implement um, cannabis regulation markets in the future. Um, I, I think, you know, I wouldn't be too critical of the, the, the Washington, Colorado model. Some of it I wouldn't have personally gone for, but I think we need to see how it pans out. And if they make mistakes, um, uh, if they mess up in some respects, um, then that's still useful information. I mean, these are only two jurisdictions out of uh, 50, whatever it is, in, in 51 in, in, in the US. Um, and we're only talking about two countries out of 180 states globally. So these are very much pioneering uh, experiments, and they are going to provide a lot of useful data, a lot of useful research um, for, other, for other jurisdictions to learn from. And some of that will be good, positive lessons, some of it will be negative lessons, but they're still going to be useful uh, lessons. We would prefer to see something a bit more like the Uruguay model, which is a more interventionist state model. We're quite cautious, at least at the beginning of this uh, journey. We think we should err on the side of caution and have more restrictive um, interventionist models. And then once that's bedded in and we've established that it's, it's, it's reasonably non-problematic, then we can move, move on from that in the future. Um, and perhaps have relaxed things a little and have less interventionist things once some social norms have em emerged and social controls around um, more embedded cannabis markets in the future. But for now, we're just going to have to see. And, and in a way, we've got a very interesting controlled experiment here. We've got uh, more commercial models, more restrictive government models, and we can see which ones work best. And that's going to be an interesting uh, experiment. One thing that's made <clears throat> all this reform possible is the shift in public attitudes, which is p particularly notable in the US. Um, polls now say a majority of uh, Americans favour legalisation. Why do you think that shift has happened? Um, I think there's a whole, a whole, a whole uh, variety of factors have influenced the public opinion in the US. Um, there's clearly a demographic shift. Uh, so the sort of baby boomers are growing up, their kids are growing up, people who've been exposed to the drug culture and see it as relatively non-problematic, it's certainly around cannabis are uh, not so um, vulnerable to some of the sort of scaremongering and, and, and hysteria and panic, sort of reefer madness stuff of the past. Um, I think there has been, clearly the medical cannabis thing in the US has had an influence. I think it's to a certain degree helped sort of uh, remove a certain degree of the th sort of threatening narrative around cannabis by showing that regulated cannabis markets can exist again relatively non-problematically. Um, and I think, I think also, I think some of the campaigners and non-government organisations uh, and uh, media and public uh, advocates for reform have got themselves organised, they've honed their messages and they've been increasingly effective at influencing public opinion because their arguments are very strong and they've been put over very well. So I think there's a whole bunch of things going on there. Um, it is interesting to see how change is being driven from the bottom up by public opinion in the US, whereas interestingly in Uruguay, public opinion is not supportive, it's not a majority support, it is growing, so it's in the high 30% support now in, in Uruguay, whereas in, in the US it's over 50, and so in the reform states it's, it's, it's higher still. But in Uruguay, it's actually, rather than being driven from the bottom up by uh, sort of act uh, activist public opinion, it's actually um, been principled leadership from the government. This is an unfamiliar concept for, for many people in drug policy that, that government would actually show leadership uh, in, in drug policy reform. But, but there you are. So it's, again, there, there's this contra interesting contrast between the, between the Latin American developments and uh, the things that are happening in the US in that one is sort of politically driven from the top and the other one is politically driven from the bottom. That, that's an interesting point because this is an area where governments generally show the opposite of leadership, isn't it? Yes, I mean, you know, governments have historically been quite fearful and, and, and often quite um, opportunistic around, around the drugs issue. And it, it, the drugs issue can work for them quite well. They've set up this sort of uh, threat-based narrative where the drugs are an evil which threatens our children and our communities and our society. And um, once you've hyped up this threat, then you can justify, you can put yourself forward as um, a response to the threat. We are the answer. We will defend you and your children in your streets and so on and so forth. 
Um, and that's worked very well as a political narrative for a long time. But I think the, 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 the potency of that as a, as a sort of political narrative is diminishing in light of the increasingly obvious failures of, of that approach. So people kind of, they're, they're not buying it anymore because they see increasing amounts of money being spent on this approach and yet the outcomes are also disastrously bad, both in terms of levels of use and misuse, but also all the harms associated with the illegal trade that prohibition fuels. So people are frustrated with that and, and they're not buying into the narrative and obviously the campaigners and advocates for reform are, are challenging it more and more effectively. Um, and people just don't buy that anymore. But it has worked for a long time for politicians, but that, the, the balance is now shifting. The, the scales are tipping in favour of a pragmatic, carefully, clearly, coherently argued position where you say, actually, the safer, healthier uh, communities that we all want to see would be more effectively delivered with uh, the government in control of these drug markets rather than a bunch of criminals and gangsters and, and, and violent entrepreneurs. So uh, again, uh, th that shift is very marked in the US and I think in increasingly in other, in other places around the world as well. That's still a hard sell to some people in those communities though, isn't it? That they believe that if you remove the social sanction from marijuana, more people will use it. It's not necessarily about re removing the social sanction, it's about removing the legal sanction. I mean, well, you, you, it's still perfectly acceptable and, and right for a government to encourage people to make responsible lifestyle choices and educate them about drug risks and encourage them not to use drugs. I don't think that's an um, inappropriate thing for a government to do. The question is, is using a uh, criminal justice system the way to do it? And it's actually very odd, if you think about it, in the, in the public health arena to be using the police as, uh, and the criminal justice system and, and criminal punishments as a way to educate people about public health. Um, encourage us to watch choices. We, we have institutions, public health in education institutions for doing that much more effectively. We, and we don't criminalise people for eating fatty foods or for having unsafe sex or any number of other sort of health risks. But with drugs, not even all drugs, just some drugs, we've decided that this is an appropriate way to do that. And it, actually it's very expensive um, and it doesn't work. In fact, it's worse than that. It's actually counterproductive. If you criminalise your target populations, you know, young people or vulnerable populations who are are likely to be using or misusing drugs, you actually alienate um, the, your, your target audience. And it would be far more effective from a public health perspective to be spending the money um, that we're currently putting into enforcement, the billions of dollars globally, um, or in New Zealand, you know, hundreds of mil millions spent on drug enforcement, far more effective from a public health perspective to be putting that into a proven prevention, treatment and uh, harm reduction. But uh, and I, I think the, the public and policymakers are coming round to that now, um, especially interestingly at a time of sort of economic crisis and a, and a global recession and so on. Uh, the, 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 the tolerance of the public and of policymakers for hosing endless millions into clearly counterproductive and ineffective um, enforcement programmes is, is waning. It sounds like you're saying the, the political balance on this issue has tipped. It's tipped in some places. Um, I mean, I can't speak for New Zealand or, or specifically. Or in, in the UK, we're getting close to a tipping point. I think on the cannabis issue, in key in some key places, certainly in the US, I think we've passed a tipping point now. Um, it's but but this is a this is a policy that's been in place for generations. It's going to take an. It's not something that's going to end overnight. Not just with cannabis, but with with drug law reform more broadly. A, a, a wider paradigm shift. Um, from a criminal justice sort of paradigm to a, to a public health paradigm is going to be is a generational challenge. It's not going to happen overnight. But certainly on, on the cannabis issue, in some key places, I think a tipping point has been reached. Um, and I think that will inform uh, a, a wider debate around a wider selection of drugs um, and, you know, in, in, in jurisdictions around the world in, in the coming years. So what you're saying is that if uh, this isn't a disaster and the results are positive, uh, in places like Colorado, that we'll start having this conversation about other currently illicit drugs. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm very interested to look at what happens with the New Zealand uh, New Psychoactive Drugs Bill, which is very pioneering and very interesting for drug policy people, because what you have there is a, a regulation model very similar to the stuff that Transform is advocating and uh, talking about for cannabis um, elsewhere, you've got a regulation model that can potentially be used for non-cannabis drugs. So it could be used for stimulants and maybe some psychedelics and some other stuff. And it's going to be very interesting to see in the coming years how effective that is. But, you know, again, I'm sure mistakes will be made and lessons will need to be learned. But 
Um, we are beginning at a, a, a government and policy level to explore regulatory alternatives to a sort of default prohibition criminal justice model. And I think that's certainly the, the trajectory of change is moving in that direction, but there are numerous political, um, social and public opinion obstacles to that. But they, they see, those obstacles seem to be kind of uh, dissolving away fairly fast, but clearly change will happen at different drugs in different places at different speeds, and we'll have to see how that pans out. There's a view here that that could happen through a public health process in, in New Zealand, but the hard part's going to be the actual smoking. Smoking anything is demonstrably unhealthy. Sure, but I mean, uh, one of the things that regulation can do is it can encourage safer methods of use. So clearly smoking is... is it's a very convenient and often quite sociable uh, way of consuming cannabis or other drugs, um, but it's, it's intrinsically unhealthy because you know, it creates tars and it's not good for your respiratory health. But there are other ways of consuming cannabis. You can vaporize cannabis um, in Colorado now for the medical use, and there's a certain amount of crossover into non-medical use. People are using e-cigarette type technology where you have a, a cannabis oil is vaporized in a sort of little e-joint e or whatever they're gonna be called. Um, and it's, it's very much like a smoking process, but it's considerably healthier because you don't have the tars and carcinogens associated with burning. So it's, you create a kind of vapour of this cannabis oil and you have a fairly convenient, pleasant, healthier uh, way of consuming cannabis, which is still able to dose control fairly well. I suspect um, smoking cannabis will see, in, in 10 years' time, it will seem kind of, sort of quite a strange sort of thing that people used to do in the past, like listen to vinyl instead of iPods or... Um, I suspect that's where we're going. We're, we're going to be moving towards safer, um, not safe, but safer, uh, lower risk uh, methods of consuming cannabis and potentially other drugs as well. But also you'll be in safer environments which are controlled and have you know, uh, professional staff there. You'll also have information on the packaging that will outline um, you know, the potency of THC and CBD and so on. And there'll be health warnings, you know, don't consume this and drive, don't consume this if you're pregnant. Uh, you know, if you have these issues, be, be careful, blah, blah, blah. The kind of thing that you have on um, pharmaceutical drugs routinely now um, and, and increasingly having on tobacco products and at some point one day we may even have on alcohol products. But clearly, uh, I mean, and, and the tobacco and alcohol thing is fascinating. I think that possibly um, some of the developments in, in cannabis policy, if we can demonstrate best practice in how to regulate cannabis in a responsible public health driven way, it may actually help inform and improve uh, alcohol and tobacco policy as well. So there may be a, no a positive knock-on effect there. We'll see you in 10 years' time. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting. I look forward to seeing <laughs> how it all works out. Cheers. Thanks very much. Um, anyway, one of the new government's first 100 days promises is action on medical cannabis. What does that really mean? I'm not sure they know. And what to make of the promises of a referendum on cannabis law reform? Uh, there's one guy I always ask about this stuff um, because he's a pot geek and he knows. Uh, it's Chris Fowley, the president of Normal New Zealand. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Russell. Um, so we have not law reform promised, but a referendum. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, on the one hand, we're very positive because we think we will uh, comfortably win any referendum. Um, but I think we've got concerns over what exactly the question is going to be, whether it's going to be binding and how long it's going to take. Um, if we're looking at the 2020 election and then a law change after that, which might take two years, three years, then you're talking at current arrest rates, we're going to have 50,000 people arrested at about $1.5 billion cost in that time. So, uh, yeah, we're kind of concerned about the time frame. Mm. Um, but um, I guess there are some advantages to a referendum in that it forces, it, it makes sure the conversation has to be had. Exactly, yep. And uh, it gives us three years to have a really good conversation. Um, and, uh, but again, it comes back to being binding. Um, if we want people to get inspired by this referendum, if we want them to turn up and vote for it, um, it's got to be something progressive. Um, I don't think people are really going to be, you know, if it's something like fines or something really insipid. Um, at the moment, all we have to go on is... Uh, it's a referendum about legalising personal use, is what we've uh, heard in the media. We don't really know much more about that. Um, but is it limited to use? Um, if you're legally allowed to use it, then are you allowed to grow it? Or are you allowed to share it? Are you allowed to buy it? Um, so these are the sorts of questions we need to have. But yeah, we've got um, three years to have it. It strikes me. I mean, you, as normal, have been advocating a long time. This seems like a very important few years for you. 
Exactly. I think uh, we're in a new phase. So everything that we've done up till now, there's a lot of people celebrating, right? There's a lot of people um, thinking that we're going to have legalisation tomorrow, people thinking that it's already happened as part of the coalition agreement. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a bit of getting ahead of ourselves there. Um, it, it, yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a big big couple of years for normal. Yeah, yeah. So... It, it, yeah, what we've done in the in the past in terms of our activism and our organising, I think that's in the past and we're in a new phase now and we've got to really reach out to a whole lot of um, other organisations and really broad sections of the community um, and work to a common plan so that we're not at cross purposes um, and we're going to have to look at some decent funding as well to, you know, to really do it properly. Where's that going to come from? Well, that is the interesting question. Um, overseas, when you look at places like America, when they have binding referenda, so then people can actually make a kind of investment decision and go, well, okay, if I fund this, it will happen, and not just be years and years of talking about it. Um, then you do find kind of wealthy individuals step up and for the good of it, go, yes, let's fund that. Um, if it's not binding, that might be a lot more difficult. Um, you also might find that some of the people in Australia, there are some really big businesses that have been created in their medical cannabis um, industry over there, which is very industry Industry focus. They actually have fewer medical cannabis patients approved in Australia than we do in New Zealand, even though we hear that it's been legalised over there. Um, but actually, it's like only about 100 patients that have got it. Um, but the, you have these multi-million dollar um, businesses that can't bring products to market because they've gone down this pharmaceutical route. So it's possible that some of those companies, which as I say, are now very wealthy or very kind of well-resourced, might view... Um, if they can help reform in New Zealand and actually help them in Australia too. What do you make of Labor's first 100 days promise on, on medical cannabis? Because I'm not sure I understand what they've promised. Yeah, I'm not sure anyone does, actually. The, you know, again, we, we don't really know what's going on there. Um, we're, we're trying to find out. We're, we're coming up with our kind of our, our, our bottom line that we can present to them um, and try and work with them on that. Um, but, again, this, this kind of deadline they've created for themselves with 100 days, it is really good to have action, and it's one of the things that we want, is we want these changes to have immediate effect, not just be kind of creating a product development pathway that takes five or ten years like a pharmaceutical, but we need something immediate. Um, so it's good to have it in that 100 days, but our worry is that they don't really know what they actually want yet, and they may, this is the risk, get captured by the bureaucrats who may recommend just some minor kind of tinkering, a bit like what we saw with cannabidiol, the CBD, that again, was reported all around the world as New Zealand has legalised medical cannabis, and that happened in September, and not a single prescription for, can for cannabidiol has been granted. Why not? Uh, well, they'd still keep it a controlled drug for a start, so it's actually they've just carved out this little exemption that makes it a little bit easier, but it's still being treated like a controlled drug rather than a medicine, and there are no actual products approved because they haven't created any kind of mechanism to get them approved. And yet it seems that... I mean, New Zealand actually has quite a good uh, industrial tradition of growing plants for attributes. We could do this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the wine industry or, or even our sort of craft beer industry or um, the hops down in Nelson, um, you know, there's plenty. You know, we're definitely an agricultural um, uh, country, you know. And, um, and in fact, if you look at Australia, again, as a kind of example of what's going on, um, one of the big companies that's got involved there is Tasmanian Alkaloids. They're the number two poppy producer in the world. And they now have a subsidiary in Tasmania to grow medical cannabis. Um, so... Yeah, you could easily envisage something like that here. Now, we, of course, don't want that to be the only route because you then end up with these problems like you've got in Australia where it just takes too long and it's all about big business. Um, that's an option that needs to be there, but you also need to have an ability for patients to grow their own and especially for domestic production because we want to get those prices right down so it's actually affordable and accessible to people, not just a kind of pipe dream of some time in the future. Mm. Um, you talked about you know, the pharmaceutical route as, as a bad thing, but I do kind of get what doctors are saying when they say, I'm not going to prescribe something whose potency and composition I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I only think it's a problem if it's the only choice, because at the moment there are no products that meet that, and they're, they're trying to deal with what is a herb or a plant through laws that are essentially designed for novel synthetic substances and, and, and all that. Um, so, yeah... 
we're not saying that that pharmaceutical approach is bad, but that there should be multiple options for people. And if you look at, say, opiates, which are a much riskier substance, you do have things like um, morphine and, and heroin and things available under medicines as well as being controlled drugs. Um, but then you can also have um, poppy seed bagels in your bread and or you know poppy seeds yeah. in your food. And that's not illegal, um, you know. So you can have a, an approach like that for cannabis, where you treat it as a herb or a food at one level, and uh, so that people can have their own. Um, but if you want to prepare it as a medicine, then it goes through a pharmaceutical process. Hmm. Um, yet at the moment, there does seem the fairly urgent matter of so-called green fairies being arrested, mm -hmm. and 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 I think even if you doubt the efficacy of some of the products, they don't. I don't think they're doing anyone any harm, and yet they are being dragged into court. What should happen mm. there? Well, I think especially with the change of government and the um, the pathway to reform that they've laid out with the medical cannabis taking priority, this referendum happening, the police need to um, you know be aware of that, change what they're doing. They could easily declare, declare a moratorium on, on arresting people or at least certain conditions. Um, this is completely within their powers. And in fact, the police hierarchy in response to any media inquiries always say that officers have discretion. So what we need is for officers to actually start using that a lot more. Now, um, when the police have been busting these green fairies recently, they've become aware that it's medical and they've proceeded with it. Now, they could actually stop at that point and not proceed with it. This is totally within their powers. We all see this with uh, driving down the road, where the police tolerate going to 60 or 110, or they tell you when they're changing that. It's really well publicised. Everyone knows what the tolerance is. It's not a guessing game or up to individual officers. It's very well stated. So this is what we think the police should do, especially as we're trying to have this conversation. Because if half the country is a criminal, you can't really have an, an open, honest discussion. And just finally, my impression is that we will follow, if there's any model we'll follow, it's Canada. They're a fellow mm. liberal democracy. Mm. They're taking a very methodical, cautious approach. Do, do you think you know, we'll look to Canada? Possibly. Um, I think we need to learn from all countries out there that are doing it, and also pay attention to what's unique about New Zealand. Um, some of the concerns with Canada is that it's a little bit government-centric. They're, they're sort of trying to set up an agency and have all cannabis supplies go through this government agency. Well, in some agency. provinces, it's, 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 it's a government monopoly, isn't it? Mm, mm, mm. Um, and, but also, you know, while they're putting this law through to um, create what they're doing on that level, they're closing down dispensaries and arresting a whole bunch of people, and it's kind of a bit of a dog's breakfast in Canada, but... Yeah, I see what you mean. It is a, a similar country that I think we could definitely learn a lot from. Cool. Um, a uh, question. A question. Oh, okay. Um, do you think there's an issue of inclusivity when it comes to the wider discourse around drug law reform in terms of a lack of understanding? Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of myths, of course, um, and a lot of issues around language that we use that create different impressions. I mean, even when people talk about recreational cannabis, it kind of just in the word, it implies partying in the streets or kind of being a bit irresponsible. So we prefer to call that adult use rather than recreational use. And then you find people are a lot more receptive to it. Um, but certainly um, users need to be at the heart of any conversation around it. And as I say, if the, if the police are still going hard arresting people, then that's really difficult to do. So they at least need to say some public statements about, hey, we, we're actually calling a halt to the arrest so that we can have this conversation. Well, for those who are wondering what my <laughs> radio scores are like, uh, I'll try the Afirana extract and see how I do. Uh, uh, my rolled R's are not great. You've got you to warm those up. <laughs> nope, I'm going to start again. I'll come back. <laughs> Keep flowing, O cream, into my can. Flow straight and flow true. I don't want to lose you. Money in my account. Oh, 
Da 